I got a knock at my door, um, and it was representative of the CIA and an aerospace company, unannounced, and they said, we want to talk to you. And they wanted um, my help with a number of uh, military and diplomatic personnel who'd been, they claimed, harmed by things. Uh, they'd either heard stuff, et cetera. And long story short, the majority of the hundred or so people that I had privy to their medical records ended up being the first of the Havana syndrome patients. Oh. Um, they'd heard things in their head, et cetera. But what they had done was they had shown me the data literally that day in my office. They brought out the MRIs, they brought out the x-rays and the damage in the brain, et cetera. That was clear. I mean, it wasn't, it was not just data, it was evidence that something had happened. Uh, it wasn't somebody's story, it was evidence um, that was repeatable. Um, and so that took us about three or four years to figure out what they were. And it was at about the time that actually the Havana events were occurring that we realized that all the symptoms of what it is that we were seeing in this group of patients were matching what it was that the Havana syndrome individuals had. So in a way that was good because that meant that those 90 or so patients who matched, we could hand over to the national security people. And you know it became a real thing. And now there's like a DOD website that has anomalous health incidents where people can come forward and report the stuff that they've got. And here's the ways you can use the Veterans Administration to seek medical help. Whereas previously, they'd been shooed away as we don't want to hear about this. What do they think it is? It's an energy weapon of some kind, a microwave or other energy or gamma energy weapon. And that sounds, okay, that sounds crazy, except no one would admit or no one would deny that we have the capability to do it. It's basically if, if you take the front off your microwave and turn it on and put your face near it, you'll get burned. So this is just a way to direct the microwaves or sound waves. At specific individuals. At specific individuals. And, and do, do you think it was experimental or no. – no. So these are targeted people with specific oh, yeah. intention to get those Absolutely. people because they had some function that they wanted to They wanted to annoy they wanted to get them out of their out of the way. Oh, because they were in Havana. Because they were in Havana. And right. but it's been used all over the world. You know, I still get um emails from military personnel saying this and this and this happened to me. Here's my medical records and so now I just I know they know that I'm a safe place to approach because then I know where to send them on the inside. But what was interesting was that once we had set that aside and I've advised the Senate Intelligence Committee and I've advised them the a house on things I wrote a white paper for them years ago on what I thought needed to be done. But what was interesting were the remaining 10 people who had, uh, you know, who didn't have Havana syndrome, but had a series of other problems. And several of them had said that part of their problem was initiated because they'd come in contact with what they had claimed to be a UFO. By the way, I just noticed that you have a UFO on the wall behind you. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're all in over here. That... Um, you said it was 10 people that didn't have Havana syndrome, that mm -hmm. they had some sort of an injury that was mm -hmm. associated with a UAP event. Mm -hmm. What was their thing? Did they have an implant or was there a... No, oh, some of them had like, uh, uh, they had what you would call white matter disease in their brain, like they had been exposed to something. So white matter disease, if, if you have, for instance, multiple sclerosis, um, and you look in the brain with MRI, you'll see these white areas which are basically dead. Uh, tissue, scar tissue. Uh, they had things like that. One person, um, one of the pictures that I had was that they had claimed to have seen something in their backyard. They shone a flashlight at it, and the moment they did, they got zapped. And then you see the picture of the guy in, in the back of his back of his neck. Um, this huge welt and a bruising and a scarring uh, that could there, there's. There's no reasonable way you could have gotten something like that um, just by exposing yourself to a flame, as a for instance, or a blowtorch. Um, and so it's these kinds of events that, uh, and the unfortunate issue with these is that they're not repeatable. They're one-off anecdotes. Right. Um, you, and you certainly can't put a person in a place where they become bait for these kinds of events to occur. 
and uh, so you're sort some of some people would volunteer for that though. S- somebody might, yeah, to go get zapped. Uh, um, you know about the Travis Walton story, right? Very much, yeah. Yeah. What yeah. did you? What do you think of that? You know, he's kept to his story over all of the years. That's um, what's so confusing. Yeah, I mean, he's had no reason. I, I don't know that he's profited off of it. Uh, he, you know, I find it fascinating. You know, but it's yeah. it's 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 the irreproducibility of the events that the skeptics, I call them more pseudo skeptics, they're pseudists like nudists, they're pseudists that use these one offnesses of these events to disparage the entire, uh, you know, idea of it. Uh, it sounds ridiculous. Well, of course it sounds ridiculous because you're talking about something that a is outside spaceship of spaceship that zaps people. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Know, it do, and and. I don't think that even he would propose, Travis, that he was purposefully hurt. Right. I mean, if you walk across an airfield and get in the plume of a jet engine, you're going to get hurt. Right. You know. Yeah, and his story is that he was taken aboard to heal him. Yeah. That there was something something happened to him during that event. And but the crazy part is that all the other people that are in the truck, they witnessed it, and then they passed polygraph examinations. Right. Right. They also told the same story independently when they took them and separated mm-hmm. them. And then Travis Walton shows up five days later with the same clothes on. Right. With this crazy story. Right. You know, so when people say that, you know, there's no evidence or where's the evidence, my first question to them is, well, what have you, have you read any books about any of this? Do you, have you spent even a moment looking into it? And, you know, I would point them at books like by Robert Powell and Michael Swords, UFOs and Government, which is not a... Uh, a proposal that any of this is real. It's just the story of uh, these events over decades. And so there's there's books like that, dozens of them, that tell the story of data and evidence. How you contextualize it is, you know, up to your personal biases, let's say. But there's plenty of evidence. But if people haven't looked into it, if they have an opinion about it, uh, and they haven't looked into it, they're more like priests than they are scientists. Yeah, that's, it's also the public. The general public narrative is UFO equals kook. Right. You're a kook. You believe in that? That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. And and I don't believe in anything. I believe in the data and the evidence and, and the evidence. There's not enough evidence for me to tell a colleague of mine it's real. Right. But there's enough evidence for me to say there's a question worth answering.